Hello, everyone. Welcome to the program today. I see a lot of people entering the room for our special online forum program that we've put together for you. My name is Sarah Bryant. I'm your education director at DBA Platform, where our mission is to get you found. Now, you already know that DBA Platform is the premier software and solution provider for managing local presence at scale and winning visibility for your locations on Google, Bing, Apple, and other platforms that consumers use in their buying journeys. So today we're gonna to talk about reputation SEO for healthcare providers and how medical systems can improve visibility in the all important Google search. You're gonna see that the healthcare industry has its own dynamic in profile creation and in optimization. And especially today, we have someone joining us from Raider 8, a top rated healthcare reputation management solution. Raider 8 understands how vital directory listing information is when it comes to choosing healthcare professionals, and they're going to share with us the insights on taking control of your online image. So the agenda, we have a bunch of things to talk about. We're going to go back and forth with, with Hugh and Chris talking about how patients behave online and how to use the Google Business Profile system in healthcare how this reputation SEO really impacts the Google search results, where it does, where it doesn't. And one of the favorite parts of our webinar program is at the end, we'll open up for the Q&A, the question and answer, where we're going to collect your questions throughout the program about healthcare local SEO. And then we're going to give our experts the opportunity to apply their knowledge to your particular inquiries. So before we get started, please take a second and find your Zoom controls. We're going to get familiar with those. Um, you're going to see you have a chat, and your chat is really an administrative function to talk to the administrators of the webinar today. But the most important feature that you want to get is that Q&A button. And if you launch that widget right now, you're going to be able to see all the questions that are posted by all the attendees. And then you can upvote the questions that are most pertinent for you. And when we reach the end of with the Q&A section, then we're going to sort the questions by the most votes and the most popular questions will get answered first. So feel free to pop your questions in there throughout the time today and certainly vote for questions that you see accumulating there. We will have a recording from today's session and it'll get sent out to all of the attendees of the webinar. Plus, you can find it in our Facebook group. And now let me introduce our education team for today. Uh, if you've been on our webinars before, you know Chris Lytle, our CEO at DBA Platform. Before DBA, Chris was at Google for almost 10 years, uh, leading go-to-market efforts across several products. And most recently there, he was the global lead of local shopping. Uh, Chris was just sharing with us as we started the webinar that he, he was one of the most popular guys at his kids' um, uh, Bring Your Parent to Work Day. Because uh, Google is such an interesting, uh, and he has so many anecdotes about, you know, Google and how it works. Uh, and we have our special guest, Hugh McLearn. He's a senior solutions consultant for Raider 8, healthcare's top-rated reputation management solution. And really, Hugh is all about helping healthcare systems and hospitals and even private practices to build the best possible reputation and outshine their competition online. And next, you know Jan Gilbert. He's one of the regulars of our webinar series because he is a master in local SEO. Jan is the creator of Local Falcon, which is the original Google Maps grid tracking system that's widely revered as the very best uh, go-to product for local SEO analysis. And Jan is also part of a very exclusive group of people called the Google Platinum Product Experts that regularly get together with Google and talk about all of these, these programs. And my name is Sarah Bryant. I'm your session concierge and a fellow knowledge seeker in the quest to understand how to leverage the digital world and bring more consumers into our digital properties easily, at scale, automatically. And we're going to learn a bunch about that today. So um, I want to just start by saying thank you to Hugh for the last couple of weeks of collaboration and all the stuff that We've, we've done together um, in talking about how the world of uh, local SEO optimization and reputation are so closely linked. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me on. Looking forward to this today. Um, so 
you know, to get started, I think it's always a good place to start of, you know, why do we do what we do? Why is it important? And, and that starts with, you know, how patients are, are finding doctors and, and healthcare online. Um, so I don't know if we're going to go to the next slide. So here's some statistics of, of you know, how patients are using uh, the reviews that they see online to choose their healthcare. And it's just at this point, this is just a fact of, of the digital age and how people are, are finding providers. And so there's a couple of things, right? You move to a new city, I got to find new doctors, right? I need a primary care. Maybe I have some other health conditions. I'm looking for a new physician. The first thing I do is I go onto Google and I start reading about who's the highest rated. And you can see these statistics kind of back that up. The other thing that will happen is people might get referred to a provider right? I go into my PCP, I have something going on with my eye or my back or whatever it might be. They give me a list of referred providers. I'm going to start typing in those names, right? I'm going to start reading what other patients have to say about this. And so this is why, you know, the, the user-generated content or patient-driven content that they're seeing online is, is extremely important for, for your practice. Um, so the other piece of that is, you know, at this point, because most, um, you know, most practices, hospitals have something going on, they're getting reviews, right? If you have a system like Raider, and eight, Raider 8 in place, you're getting tons of reviews, right? And, and that's really the, one of the most important factors at this point, because if you, if you look at kind of side-by-sides of two, you know, Google business profiles um, or reviews for groups, if I see one that's like 4.8 stars and has three reviews, but I see one that's 4.7 stars and has a thousand reviews, I'm much more likely to trust the group that has tons and tons of patient reviews. There's just a lot more me, for me to trust at that, at that level. And really the number that we strive for, and this comes from a study out of Northwestern, is about 30 reviews is when mm -hmm. patients start to trust the number of reviews and the rating that they see together. Um, so that's kind of an important figure that, that, we, that we look at with our clients. Yeah, that's really interesting too, because you know, we, we work across a number of, of verticals, you know, whether it's restaurants, retail, auto dealers, all those good things. And what's just fascinating is that so much of the shopping behavior is consistent. You know, there are reviews that are critical. And I think what's, what's important about this is that it is a, a a, be, a, a shopping consumer behavior that we are all starting to do across whether you're at Amazon, you know, or whether you're looking for a good pizza shop out of town, or you're looking for an oncologist. I mean, like, it's all the same kind of, you know, uh, you know, what do, what, do, what do folks think? And again, you got to have that, you know, that uh, critical mass of reviews in order for, you know, whatever that star rating is to be relevant. Because I think we all know that folks occasionally might have a friend or somebody log in and say something nice about them. Yep, absolutely. And, and you know, there's other places that this trust comes into play. I, we talk about mainly being patient focused, um, you know, and attracting new patients. And a lot of these specialties that we work with are highly competitive uh, in terms of the number of options that patients have. But another phenomena that we look at is when you're trying to attract talent right? You're trying to attract new providers. Well, as a, if I'm a doctor out of med school and I'm looking to join a group and you're trying to, you know, kind of court me into joining your practice and I go online and I see your two stars and patients are upset all the time. I mean, that's going to be a factor in, in, you know, attracting new um, talent. So that's another area that, that this helps in. Great context. Um, so uh, we're going to dig in a little bit on, on Google business profiles for healthcare. And, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, Sarah and I were chatting about this and, you know, Google business profiles were definitely not created with healthcare in mind, you know, um, but over the course of time, they've come to really adopt a lot of really healthcare specific functionality um, that is, is, is pretty compelling. And, you know, frankly, I don't think a lot of folks are aware of it. Um, so I'm going to show a, uh, a what a fully optimized uh, healthcare business profile might look like, um, and I had all these nice animations in there, but I lost them somehow along the way. So I apologize. You have to go with it old school. Um, but you know, starting number one, front and center, as he says, 
how many reviews do you have and what's that star rating looking like, right? So that's the beginning of it. As you see, it's very close to the top. Um, and by the way, there is no Northeastern orthopedics. I uh, invented that because I wasn't able to find any provider that was actually doing everything right. I'm sure they're out there, but I wasn't able to find anybody. So let's start with the reviews. Um, and then the categories are really important. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a little bit more in a second about how many diverse categories there are um, and how important it is that you register for as many of those relevant categories as you can. Um, because so much of this is aligning what you offer with what a consumer might be shopping for, right? So if it's a restaurant, they might be looking for, you know, like a, a, a vegetarian black owned uh, place that's open now with delivery, right? So you wanna make certain if you're a restaurant, they have every single thing that somebody might be, shop, uh, might be shopping for, whatever those criteria are in your profile, the categories are so important. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how the healthcare categories are ever evolving. Quality photos are really important, right? So uh, if, if you don't add photos, sometimes Google might find photos for you, and they might not be the best photos, you know, or you might be subject to what people are uploading. So the more photos that you upload that are of high quality, that show the inside of your practice and what a great environment it is, the better impression you're going to be making. Uh, and the less likely it is that those photos are going to be dominated by some something that shouldn't be there. The telemedicine link is a new thing that's really exciting. And so this really depends on which category. There are only certain categories that are allowed to put this link. And another reason why it's so important that you take uh, your, that you avail yourself of every category that you possibly can, because there are certain benefits that come along with some of those categories, including telemedicine. So if you are in the business of taking uh, appointments online, this is a listing that is available to you and can connect people straight, or straight into there. Um, and then also an appointment link, uh, be, allowing folks to book directly from your Google business profile and go right into your link um, to book appointments is a really a nice feature to have. In some cases, for certain verticals, Google actually has a, an appointment process that takes place within Google Business Profile. They don't do that with healthcare because they want to stay away from all the HIPAA uh, considerations. So when you click on that appointment link, it's going to go to your HIPAA compliant appointment booking solution. Um, next is the insurance check. And this is a new functionality that a lot of folks aren't familiar with. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about this, but it's basically a mechanism by which uh, your help, your insurance providers are listed on your on your profile. And by the way, Chris, Karen, Karen chimed in in the, the chat and said the insurance section on the GMB listing is a nightmare because it's virtually impossible to know every single plan for every payer we accept. So we end up just having to try to like sort them as Google auto populates them. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go into that in a little bit of detail. Like so. The thing is with Google in general is that they, they tend to come up with ideas that sound good on a whiteboard and then they put it out there and then the real world intrudes on their, you know, their hastily put together plans and then they get feedback and they improve it. So I'm confident that that's a great example. You know, things are new. They're trying to accommodate the needs of a lot of folks. And so it is something I'm confident will be improved and we'll dig into that in just a second. Uh, on the Q&A section, you know, if you t if if you don't answer your questions and you know your answers, your folks online will. And so you don't want the general public answering questions about your business. You want to answer those questions. And more importantly, you can take the opportunity to pre-populate those questions with the questions that you expect your potential patients to be asking, but also including terms for which they might be searching. So, for example, if there's particular practice that you are engaged in that's a very specific term, you might want to ask proactively, do you help with this condition? And then you can say, yes, we help with this condition all the time, those kind of things. Um, and then on the other side here, there's a, you know, a from the business owner. And a lot of times folks don't fill this out. And it's a great opportunity to tell more about your practice and dig into some more search uh, engine words that will help uh, folks find you. And then finally, there are the post tools that almost nobody uses. 
Um, and one of the things that Google looks at when it's trying to evaluate the quality of your listing is do you post and how frequently do you post? Um, and so this is something that we recommend that people do, you know, maybe a couple times a month, put, put some article out there, a little bit of a post that, you know, lets Google know that you're active on there, but also you're giving folks more opportunities to engage with your brand when they do land on your profile. So going into just a little bit more detail, staying current on categories. So these are some pretty recent additions uh, that have come up and you might think to yourself, oh my God, I already put in there like pediatric medicine, I've got it covered. Well, apparently not. Um, so it's really important to stay on top of all the categories that are being added. Um, and this is something that we do in our professional services that we make certain that your practice is always up to date on the latest categories that are available. Um, <clears throat> Whoops, there she be. The check insurance feature that we just described. So uh, there, there's a couple of really interesting points that come up there. One is, is that it's this interesting combination of the uh, listing provider being able to go in there, in there and add and edit insurance providers. But uh, as, the, as the, 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 the chat mentioned, Google will auto-populate that for you. And there are a couple of sources uh, that you might find uh, populating Google. So you might go and remove a carrier, but if that carrier then tells Google that you're that that they're supporting your location, it might reappear in your listing. So it does require some constant pruning and resorting. There is an option just to turn it off altogether. Um, we don't recommend that because a lot of times folks are starting their search with who is an ophthalmologist who carries Aetna, who support, you know, who takes my insurance plan. So there's a lot of value in offering that. Uh, there's some challenges that kind of go into it. We actually just released a blog article this morning uh, at the DBA platform site um, that talks in more detail about how to address this and how to stay on top of it. But it is something that I'm pretty confident that Google's going to take care of over the course of time and make it a little bit more user friendly. And hey, Chris, while you're on that, uh, Randy asked, could you show again where that insurance check feature appears? Sure. Sorry, some of my animations did not come through particularly well. So you see right here on the, and it's this really bland little check insurance info. Right? It's just this little link, but when you click on it, it pops up this modal or this little pop-up box here, right? Um, and I only captured this little aspect of it. So this is a modal, you're not leaving the page, it's all staying right here on the listing and you're getting that information there. All right, so there's some interesting implications for providers that are a little bit different from other businesses. One of them is the fact that you'll have multiple providers at one location, right? Which is a little bit unusual. And so the way that Google addresses this is that it allows you as a provider to have your own listing and then be able to associate that listing with a practice, right? So an analogy of this is like uh, with malls. They allow the similar functionality for a mall. So I can say, yes, this is Banana Republic in Linux mall. So there's a listing for the provider, there's a listing for the practice. There's a listing for the store. There's a listing for the mall. Now, the converse of this, right? So again, we have one listing for provider that notes the shared location. But we also have uh, providers that are in multiple locations. And so this is also allowed by Google. So as a provider, you're allowed to have multiple listings with the caveat that they can't be within 10 miles of each other, okay? So Google might suspend your listing if you have two listings for Dr. Sarah Bryant within 10 miles of each other. So it is definitely a consideration. And we don't want to scare anybody off by, by these things. And again, it's, it's not the end of the world. There's, there's a, a process by which you can appeal suspensions. But something to be aware of, you know, when you're dealing with Google, you're dealing with a lot of arbitrary kind of policies. And you have to they don't change a lot of times. You have to kind of work around them. So again, what's, what, 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 what we enable here is, you know, one listing for a provider at a practice 
And those listings can each note that they are part of a practice listing. And then likewise, a provider can be, can have multiple listings across multiple practices, but as long as they're not with it, as long as they're with, not within 10 miles of each other. And I think to add to that, um, you know, oftentimes what Google does, and I, I don't exactly know where it's pulled from. I think it possibly pulls from the actual practice website, they might see like Google picks up that a practice, you know, a doctor says they practice at this location or something like that. Um, so, you know, oftentimes Google may create a, a Google listing for a doctor at a location. Um, arbitrarily, they might not even see patients there. And so one of the things that we do, and I'm sure DBA does, is talk to the practice about, you know, do you see patients? Does this provider see patients at that location? If not, let's, let's close that listing or, or delete that listing. Um, kind of the typical best practice we go with is if you see more than 10% of your patients at the location, then, then yeah, it's probably good to keep. But if you're never going to see a patient there, then you can go ahead and close that listing. Yeah, that's great context, Q. And that's absolutely something that, that we help manage as well. And I think this is one of the challenges with Google in general. There's what you're doing, and then there's kind of like what Google is trying to impose on you as well. And so you're trying to prune out the stuff that Google's imposing on you that you don't want right. at the same time that you're getting the information up there that you do want. It's kind of a constant battle. You know, I think there's a mindset with a lot of folks that you just kind of set it and forget it, but you can't. It requires ongoing monitoring. And Yan had mentioned too that there are little things that affect how Google looks at these profiles, such as the hours. So it's important that if you're at a location on Tuesdays and Thursdays, that that profile mentions that because if you get overlap of a particular person at multiple profiles, that can cause some issues too. And I mean, there are things to think about. And one of the questions that we get on webinars all the time is, can you add too many categories? You know, so if you do pediatrics and you do like 12, 14, you know, if you do that, are you are you hurting your primary category in any way? So there's a lot of these little sort of nuances that affect what, you know, which searches you show up for, too. Indeed. All right. OK, I think this is. Um... Me, we're we're getting into kind of how we define reputation SEO. So, um, so reputation SEO kind of here's here's our written definition of it. But really, what it is is it's the role that patient generated content plays in your ranking and search results. So it's really kind of the culmination of kind of everything that that Raider Eight does and DBA does. It's making sure that the listings look good. It's it's really how the patient is going to interact with the reviews and the listings that they see online. Um, and it's, it's really important. And it, it kind of is a move in a slightly different direction, right? When we think about traditional SEO, it had to do with tag, tags and keyword searches and uh, making sure that those are all appearing simultaneously and at the top and thinking through what are going to be the most searched things. And so that's still important, but Reputation SEO really has to do with user-generated content, right? Um, and how are we going to get our user-generated content to work um, in our favor? Uh, and that's really what we're doing here. Um, so with that, right, um, SEO and reputation SEO, when we think of user-generated content, if you do a, a, a search right now in Google, you'll notice when Google pulls up those search results, they're actually trying to find the best match to the words that are being used in that search. And they will actually highlight the closest match to the words, right? Best or highest rated or kind or whatever the search might be. Um, and so obviously the more, it's kind of a numbers game, right? The more reviews that I am getting, the more likely that a patient is possibly going to use those words that are that are being searched for and so that's why we're we're really big and just trying to generate the highest volume of reviews for your doctors and, and your practice it's like crowdsourcing keywords like even exactly. the more if you get a thousand reviews and people say nice things about you in all the different linguistic ways that they can then 
it really boosts your ability to get found in a search. You know, and, and, and not to go off on a tangent here, but it's, it's really important, like being found on Google itself is more important than it ever was. You know, the whole game used to be like coming up high in the ranking so that people would click on your link and then go to your site. Now, and particularly now, if you all have seen what the, the new experience on Google is going to look like, um, you're going to get all the information you need on Google and people might not ever make it to your site. So, you know, all these things that, that you know, that Hugh's talking about here about having the chum in the water, so to speak, you know, all these terms out there, it's really critical and a, an important place to invest. Yep, absolutely. So this is something that I, I kind of threw in there that's really important as well, is that when we're looking at quality scores, at Google's looking at quality scores, one of the things they look at when they're evaluating the quality of your listing is how quickly you review or your reviews are responded to, positive or negative, right? So it's really important that you get to them quickly, and particularly if it's a negative review, right? Not that Google's looking at it and saying like, oh, it's taking them longer to respond to a negative review. But I've been shocked sometimes people respond to a review that's a really negative review. They respond to it three months later. It's too late. You know, yeah. you know, so you want to get that review up there quickly, obviously from a business perspective, but from Google's perspective, they they time you. <laughs> How quickly are you responding on average? Yep. And so to add to that, I mean, one of the, you know, a couple of the features that we have in Rate Rate to assist with that. One is um, we just added a feature that if um, you know patients leave a review that doesn't have a comment, we'll actually auto respond to that and it'll be correlated to the star rating. Um, so if they leave one star, there's kind of a template. If it's five star, there's a template, but there's no context, right? When it's just a star rating with no comment. So those are really easy to automatically respond to. Um, when a patient does leave a comment, both positive and negative, if you share the, the Google listing, basically you make Raterate a co-manager of the listing. Uh, we do allow you to respond to those um, comments directly out of the Raterate dashboard. So it's all aggregated. Um, and we do kind of have a, a quick reply feature that makes that really fast so that, you know, you don't have to feel like, you know, if you have to respond to 50 reviews in a day, one, that's a good problem because you got a lot of reviews. Um, but two, we don't want it to burden your whole day responding. So it should take you a few minutes uh, with our with our auto response feature. It's huge. I mean, uh, you know, at the same time that you're signaling to Google that you've got a high quality listing, you're also saving a lot of time on your on your staff. Um, so fantastic. Solution. Yeah, and I think Chris, from our perspective too, what we know, and maybe I think you maybe you said this just in in different words, but like. Google is more likely to promote a listing when they see that the, the listing owner is engaged and, and responding to that. 100%, and like oh. whether, it's, whether it's putting up posts, whether it's uh, responding to questions and answers, whether it's responding to reviews, the reviews are the biggie, you know, that's the biggie. So one of our attendees asked for clarification on that. What do you guys consider timely in terms of responding to online reviews? as soon as possible, right? I mean, like, I don't know, Jan, you can probably speak to it better than I can, but I mean, I don't know if Google has, you know, thresholds and, qu you know, like quintiles that it puts people into. My assumption is it's probably, you know, what's your average time of response? I mean, within the day would be would great if it's a positive review. If it's a negative review, you want to be there within the hour just to try to head it off. People are are and see it and you wanna reply. And you, when you're replying, you're not necessarily replying specifically to the person, especially if it's a healthcare, you can't divulge any details, but you're replying for everyone else to be able to see that you're a professional company, that you're you're being attentive, that you wanna help fix the problem. That's what your reply should be geared to. And I'm sure uh, Raider 8 does you know that very well for you. 100%, you know, and again, if. If Raterie is handling, you know, like the almost immediate response to the, you know, the content list reviews, that's that's going to boost your overall average, right? Yeah, and typically that, um, just for people's knowledge, our data would say that probably about 40% of your reviews are not going to have a comment. So it really does help, you know, uh, quite a bit. Indeed. Um, so this is a slide where we take a look at kind of what pops up when patients are searching. So 
this is the concept of a Google three pack. So if you look at, if you do a Google search, typically what Google is going to do is they're going to give you kind of the top three results. And the top three results are going to be a number of factors. Google doesn't share, maybe, maybe Yan can, but like <laughs> they're not going to share everything that goes into this algorithm of what comes up in that three pack. We know some consistent factors, engagement, number of reviews, star rating, uh, the keyword matches that are coming from the review comments things like that. There's some things we don't know, but what we do know is that the statistics are incredibly high when you do come up in that three pack as opposed to like number 10. Um, and so we, we've got some figures in terms of kind of what it looks like when you're not showing up and compared to when you start to show up. So I think the next couple slides are just illustrating some of these statistics here. Um, this is just looking at kind of Google views in relation to the listings. So before Raider 8, when you're not building any reviews, you're getting a very low level of, of reviews. Uh, you don't see a ton of views on those listings. Once you can see where Raider 8 gets implemented, uh, just the pure volume of views of the listing goes up. And then the next slide is even more important. Uh, this is really actions, right? how many calls you're getting to the practice, how many people are visiting your website, how many directions people are wanting to come to your office. And so there's a very, very strong correlation in terms of the number of reviews you're building and the actions that, that patients are taking uh, towards your business. Yeah, and that's such a, a critical point because I think a lot of times when people think about optim optimizing their, their, their business profile, it's all about winning that three pack. And don't get me wrong, winning that three pack is very important, you know, that 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 visibility. But the engagement that Hugh's talking about is also just as important because they might know, you know, the name of your practice and like, you know, they're looking for it. They're, they're researching your practice, you know? Um, so the engagement, giving them good information when they get there, representing your brand properly when you get there, you know, that's, in my mind, the more important part of the battle. So real quickly, you know, there's all these things that we can do with, you know, with your free listings to maximize your presence on Google. There's also a couple of things we can do with some paid listings as well. And, you know, at a high level, a really quick one is just brand ads. So in this example, you see on this search for Amazon Music, even though Amazon is the top organic result, the top free result, they also buy that ad because they don't want Spotify buying that ad. You know, because Google allows you to buy your competitors' names as a keyword, you can't put their their name in your ad, but th but that ad could easily have been Spotify, and there's probably some cases where it is Spotify. To be honest with you, however. Uh, it is a practice that we've seen where, you know, a, a competing practice might buy the name of your practice and then have their practice show up up top. So brand ads are a really, you know, cost effective way to improve the, the, the probability that you're going to get that top result no matter what. It also gives you the opportunity to detail a couple of deep uh, site links that you might want to identify in there, too, because you see, like, between these two, Amazon has a good five or six inches of you know space you know to themselves before you even get down to the next competitor. So you're pushing the competitors down. Um, so it's it's a very inexpensive uh, way to you know kind of to, to protect uh, your brand identity. Yeah, well, and a lot of people get confused about that. But the one thing I I I, I like to point out is that all you're doing is buying your name here. You're not buying okay. like all of orthopedics or being, you know, you're not really advertising. All you're doing is just buying a little space so that nobody else can have that little sponsored space above you because competitors do that. They do, you know, they do it all the time. So even when somebody's looking for you by name, you're going to get a competitor and then you'll get the organic ad with your name or the organic listing with your name in it. And it's just, it's kind of a weird uh, thing when you buy your own name. It's nice because from the top of the search, all the way down, it's just you. And that's what people were looking for. That's right. And what's interesting about that too is that, you know, not surprisingly, Google has studies that demonstrate that the click-through rate is significantly higher than just having the organic top result by itself. That you're just giving people more opportunities to click on something. 
So this is very inexpensive in almost all cases. If someone's really bidding against your name, though, you probably want to start getting involved. You know, so what would you say, Chris? What when you say inexpensive, what do you think the budget for just buying your own name would be? I don't know. I mean, seriously, like uh, worst case scenario, a couple bucks a month. Worst case scenario. Remember, these are all like pay per click. So these are only cases where somebody actually clicked on the ad. It's not expensive in the scope of things. On the other hand, we also know that, you know, uh, a lot of practices are very sophisticated advertisers. Um, so there's Google has recently been converting a lot of their ad formats to what they call performance max. And with performance max, you don't have to run a YouTube campaign or a Gmail campaign or a display ad campaign like you used to in all those silos. It allows you to run all those campaigns across all of Google's channels in one ad format. And it's based on people actually taking action, whether it's filling out a form or, you know, or taking some type of conversion action on the site. So this is Google's, you know, great new AI solution. And there's a lot of hype around, you know, BARD, you know, the Google's AI solutions for consumers. But, you know, Google's core business is advertising. The really smart folks in AI over at Google are working on the ad stuff. This is it, right? So this is highly targeted, anonymous advertising across all of Google's channels in a very simple format. Yeah, it's funny that this came up right now because somebody asked a couple minutes ago, is any of this SEO information being informed by Google's newly announced usage of AI? And I was thinking, I was thinking when I heard that question, just what you said, Chris, is yeah, Google's been using everything that all of their AI to enhance all these ad programs and their own algorithm. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, and actually, we've got another article on the website that was kind of like our response. It was it was in the context of um, the announced new interface that's more AI enabled. So it's, it's mostly in the context of retail and how that matters. The core learning of it, though, all this AI talk aside, it allows Google to get all the information that it might have presented to you in a series of pages of links, and summarize the best of that, put it in front of you, and then allow you to ask follow-up questions to Google, right? So the net result of that is that the need to go to that, to click through to the underlying source of information is gonna get lower, right? The net net of all that means that what people call zero-click searches, meaning I made the search, I got the answer on Google, and then I left without clicking to an external site, is only going to rise. Now, there's a whole question about what the impact this is going to have on the publishing industry, right? Because those guys like to make money on ads too. Um, so there's a question down the road about that. But the real impact of all this is that Google is going to allow you to ask your first question of Google, and then your follow-up question of Google, and then your refinement of that follow-up question to Google. And in 80% of cases, you're never gonna leave Google. So the net net of that is it's more, your presence on Google itself is more important than your website because they're gonna make their decision in many cases without ever looking at your website because they're gonna get all the information they need at Google. That's been the case more and more for a while the AI thing only accelerates it. So there's that. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> one of the things we think about is, you know, getting patients to our website. That's kind of what we've been talking about um, prior to this is, you know, coming up in the top search results, adding to that with um, some paid ads, um, but once we get to the website, you know, how are we engaging the patient in that light? And so I think this next slide um, speaks to an example. So 
I'm sure many of you out there have websites where you have provider bio pages, and that's pretty standard, right? We want to know, you know, where they were educated, how many years of experience do they have, you know, are they into research, whatever, you know, we can find. I had this experience um, not too long ago, the beginning of the year. <clears throat> I play a lot of golf and I, uh, I needed to go find a dermatologist. It's been a while since I got a skin check, right? It's a healthy thing to do. And so I looked for a dermatologist, best dermatologist near me, right? And I found a, a pretty, looked to be a pretty good dermatologist. And I go to the website and I see this because I see, okay, good doctor, good education, sounds good. Okay, now I wanna see what other patients are saying about them. Well, then I had to leave the website, right? I had to leave the website to go back out to look for reviews and read those reviews. And in the meantime, I actually saw a couple other providers that had some better reviews than, the, than this, this group did. And so I was kind of at a point where I, I was thinking outside of what I initially was. And so one of the things that we do at Raider 8 is we give our clients a testimonial widget. So if you go to the next slide, this is an example um, of a bio page where we embed all of the five-star reviews that patients can find on the outside of their website, right? On Google, health grades, we also do internal ratings. Um, so it's all aggregated. So the patient doesn't feel like I need to leave this to, to schedule an appointment, right? I have the reviews right there in front of me. I don't have to leave this website to you know, go read what other patients are saying. So we find that that really is valuable for not only the practice, but also of course the patient uh, as well. Um, the other thing that we do that we've shown a lot of success with is we will automatically post testimonial comments to Facebook. Um, and I think Facebook is interesting because it's interesting how Facebook, I think, started with a much younger group of people. It's kind of transition where I think an older population uses Facebook. Oh, yeah. Um, and, so, <laughs> and so what we do is we you know, one, I'm not really a big Facebook guy, but if I was in charge of a Facebook page for a practice, I would have a really hard time getting content on my Facebook page every day or every week. And so one of the things that we do is we auto populate, we'll do an auto post usually twice a week, once or twice a week, we'll auto post a testimonial com um, comment to the Facebook page for the practice or the hospital. And you can see these are these are actually real screenshots and you can see patients engage with this stuff right because these are are user generated um they trust what these comments are saying i mean you can see this one had 24 likes on it and comments and and it's really a an easy win for a practice to to get this type of content out. yeah there's like a redoubling effect there right because not only you getting the the love from the, the the testimonial, but then you're getting all the people chiming in with the, the likes and the, the loves on top of it. I mean, it's powerful. Exactly. And then, I mean, I haven't brushed up on my Facebook, you know, algorithm, but I imagine when people start liking and commenting, then it pops up in people's feeds and it's just a, an awareness uh, thing. Indeed. So, I wanted to talk about, you know, how Raider 8 and DVA platform together comprise a real best of breed solution. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, in my, throughout my career, I've always used the analogies of sporks. You know, I've always been like, it ain't a good spoon, it ain't a good fork, and all that kind of thing. And I'm talking about sporks today because, you know, there are folks out there that offer a watered down version of what Raider 8 does in conjunction with the watered down version of what DVA does. And, you know, I think it's a sport. And so I wanted to find an elegant way of saying this. And of course, I went to Reddit because, you know, that voice of reason. And I thought this guy really, you know, really nailed it. The benefits of having, of only having one utensil don't outweigh the fact that sporks suck at being spoons and forks, right? So I think this is appropriate to, you know, folks that are trying to do a little bit of too much. And so with DVA and Raider A, you're getting a fork and a spoon. Yeah, and I think to, you know, just thinking about what we do together, right? I, Raider A is, is the leader in our industry in healthcare reputation management and reputation SEO. Um, when it comes to making sure that our clients are getting the highest volume of reviews, high star ratings, um, all of the testimonials and internal patient survey feedback. Um, 
we're the best when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. One of the things we don't do is, is we don't, you know, claim listings and profiles and optimize. We don't have an ad component. So if what Chris was talking about before in terms of, you know, finding the ads to um, purchase and, you know, navigate that space, that's not us, right? Chris and his team, they know that space. Uh, and so it's really just a, a symbiotic partnership uh, to make sure that, you know, that online search is something that, you know, your organization is dominating. 100%, you know, um, you know, and, and, and as he said, you know, our focus is really around making certain that you're winning with Google business profile, right? Optimization of that. We do the brand ads that we spoke about. We do the, um, you know, the, the managed performance max campaigns, you know, run by former Googlers. You know, we've got some other former Googlers on the team as well. Um, and then we've got reporting and analytics, you know, that, that tie it all together. And I think Hugh did a great job of demonstrating how, you know, Raider 8's solution drives, you know, engagement, whether it be website uh, visits or clicks or phone calls. We have a, a package that basically tracks all that engagement across Google. So, um, you know, a tool set that allow you to see the results of all this optimization and reputation SEO. So, um, but I guess in the interim, we've got some, probably, hopefully, some questions from the audience. We do have some good questions, some good contextual questions. The, the, the highest voted one is about primary categories and secondary categories. So this is when you're filling out your Google business profile, and it's asking about the specific you know, uh, type of, of uh, uh, services that you provide. So the question is, how important is primary category compared to secondary category? And do you ever see them flip? And this, this might be a yeah, this might be a Yan question too, because he's in the wild looking at this stuff like with uh, you know meticulous oh, yeah. care every day. I would never try to answer this question <laughs> if I've got the master here. Right. So I'm not sure about the second part. Do you ever see them flip? So maybe you want to um, make you know write a little bit more detail what you mean by that. But the primary category is very important. It's much more important than the secondary category. So especially in this context where there's a lot of different categories, you want to pick the most specific uh, category for your primary category that you can. So you're not going to be a pediatric doctor. You're going to be a pe pediatric surgeon if you're a surgeon. You want to really pick the most specific one that you can. There's also issues where you have a lot of doctors at the same place. Um, there might be some filtering issues going on if you all pick the same primary category. So you want to make sure each doctor, if they have a special, special, if they're specialized, pick the the category um, that they that is different possibly than the other doctors in your same building or the same practice, because then you'll have less chance of one filtering out the other, even though they might be a little bit different. So you want to really go through all those primary those categories and really. Uh, be as specific as you can. There's lots of reasons. I just gave a couple of them, yeah. So a follow-up question I have for you, Ian, is like, let's say I'm an orthopedic surgeon, but I focus on, you know, knees and shoulders. Would I want knees and shoulders in my primary or would I want orthopedic surgeon in my primary and then secondary talk about knees and shoulders? I don't think it goes into that. Uh, parts of the body specific. I think it's like cardiology, like there's different foot, heart, like brain, there's all kinds of different things like that. I don't know if it goes that specific. Well, it, yeah, maybe that. maybe the pediatric uh, example. Remember we had like the, all those subcategories for pediatrics. So like at the top level, you've got your pediatric medicine and then there's all the subcategories. How does that work? Yeah, so... Again, you want to pick the most specific that you can. You can always add pediatric doctor as secondary. You can add all the other ones as secondaries, but you want to pick the most specific because that's how people are going to search because they're going to search for a specific kind of doctor and they want, you know, you want to find you and then your reviews might mention that kind of thing. So everything's going to align that way. And it also helps by not overlapping with the other doctors as your, because if your primary category overlaps with other doctors, Google's going to pick one and hide the rest because it likes to have a diversity of, of results of like locations. So if you have three doctors that are all the same pediatric doctor, Google's going to pick one of them, probably the one with the most reviews or the most engagement. And then your other two doctors won't get seen at all 
So you want to try to, to differentiate them as much as you can. And it's kind of important to note, you, you don't get to free form write them, uh, that you pick them from a list. And so it will be easy for you to identify the one that really, uh, if you had to pick one, this is what you would say you were. And then in your secondaries, you can pick all the offshoots of that and you're not limited. And, you know, so when you see the list, it's a lot easier. Uh, the next question is, how big of an impact on SEO do the GMB posts have for medical practices? Pretty significant. I mean, it goes to the quality score again, you know, and there's a number of things that Google takes into account when it's determining who's coming up for a particular query for a local search. Among them are, you know, uh, the relevance, the, uh, the location, right? How close are you to this, this location? Uh, and then also the overall quality. And this goes back to the quality score. So frequent posting increases your quality score. Uh, uh, timely review responses increases your quality score. So all of these things contribute together to you having higher visibility for your profile. Um, and I think, you know, as, you know, as Hugh kind of, you know, mentioned earlier, Google really doesn't obviously give you the recipe on everything. They kind of give you hints and clues. We've done our own case studies that kind of show before and after on a number of these things, whether it's uploading your product inventory if you're a retailer or the impact of doing steady posts as opposed to control groups that don't. We do see improvements in visibility. Um, but again, it's one of the mix of factors that go in there. Richard with Body Medics um, asked, we're, we're a clinical massage company. And he says, a redheaded stepchild. We have shuffled categories and still can't get appointment links like our competition does. Google will not disclose why. What's up? Yeah, so Google is like a weird thing that like fell from the, like a big box that fell from the sky and you're trying to figure out what's inside of it and how it works. And I'll be honest with you, I think a lot of times even the people at Google don't know how it works anymore. Um, so uh, in this particular case, uh, I'm sorry, I was looking at another question. What, what, what was the particular question you guys I'm sorry, you took it away from me. I was... Yep, sorry, didn't know you you could see that. All right, so um, he's the the thing he's asking is they shuffled their categories and their clinical massage, but they oh, can't right. get the they can't get the appointment links, which I think I think Google's thinking that they're too medical or something. Yeah, so what's interesting, this is another example of certain capabilities are only being rolled out category by category. Um, <clears throat> one of my former colleagues at Google is one of the BD folks over there, and I'm literally in the middle of a conversation with him. So. There are certain categories where the appointment setting is allowed. There are certain categories where the appointment setting actually has a deeper Google integration. And there are certain categories where nothing's allowed yet. And so beauty is one in particular that we're talking to them about. Uh, and I think that you would fall into that beauty and wellness category. So, uh, you know, I think that is imminent. If you'd like to reach out to us, uh, I think Stacy at DBA Platform could probably help you. S T A C E Y at DBA Platform.com. Yep. And I think we'll, um, at the end here, uh, Luke can put, put that into the chat. Uh, he usually provides our Facebook group where you can ask more questions and also Stacy's information so that you can talk directly to somebody who can help you. And he'll be putting that information, the links in the chat, and we'll show it on a slide in a minute. Yep. Uh, um, here. There's one yeah, thing sorry. I just wanted to say about the appointment link, just to follow up on something Chris said about optimizing the listing. So many medical practices don't and don't want to offer online scheduling. So in that appointment link, typically what we do, because you want to show that field completed, right? It helps with the optimization and completion. Um, just pop in the link for your contact us page, right? It's going to direct the patient to find a phone number and an address and if they can call you. Um, so you don't have to leave it blank if you don't have online scheduling. I just wanted to make that point. That's right. And th there's permutations of this, right? There's the really deep kind of blue button, click here to book an appointment. And right. then there's the, hey, just put your appointment link in there. So depending on your category, you're eligible for various permutations of that. Yep. 
So Karen had a question. This is one that we see a lot. She says, we used to be able to get new listings approved by Google instantly. Now we're having to jump through giant hoops and do video verification for locations that have phone trees where we can't have Google call the office. We even have to show lease information, prescription pads, the whole thing. Do you know what caused the drastic change? Yeah, there's a lot of spam. You know, there's just a lot of spam out there. Um, a lot of fraudulent, you know, attempts at uh, creating new listings. Um, and just like everything, you know, just like with email, it creates overhead and they have to figure out solutions that are sometimes painful, like having your emails go to a spam filter sometimes when they shouldn't have gone to a spam filter. So uh, that's just kind of the, 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 the situation they're dealing with. They're, they're, they're being more proactive about suspending people and forcing people to uh, go ahead and, you know, do more verification up front. And frankly, there's also been a ghost in the machine where accounts have just been suspended and, you know, without really much of a, an understanding of why. So that's one of the services that we offer is uh, instant verification and, uh, and claiming services. Um, so that's something that we can help out with as well. Uh, we have kind of a specific question. I think this sort of goes back to when we were talking about um, how uh, providers can only be on listings that are more than 10 miles apart. And so it led to a little bit of confusion in the retail. So we got a question that is, how does a company like Starbucks deal with this when they have a listing on every corner? Yeah, well, they're allowed to, they got a, you know, and everybody is. I mean, so like, if you had two practices that were side by side, you could have that. But for, but, but for Dr. Sarah Bryant, that would look like a duplicative listing, right? So that's- Yeah, so Starbucks actually has the physical retail location to have the two listings, but the doctor who moves between places looks like one business trying to claim multiple addresses. That's right. Um, so that's one of the things about Google, you know, think about this, trying to come up with the, the taxonomy of every local business in the world and try to figure out a way to make it all work. Right, it's going to be different roles for different for different folks. All right, if I squeeze in one more quick question, we will have answered all the questions, and that will actually be uh, like a uh, a record for us. So this this one is another very specific question um, from an anonymous attendee. Will a topical authority strategy be helpful with the AI search results? So if for people who don't know what a topical authority strategy is, that means to ha provide a lot of content on your website. So if I provide a lot of content on my website, would that strategy be helpful with these AI search results, like using topical authority to get the AI to use our website? But I think what Chris was saying is your website won't, you won't be shown. Well, it'll be shown, but it'll be shown as a source, right? So like, don't get me wrong, that's better than not coming up as the source. But I mean, I think probably everybody here has been on Wikipedia. And probably 99% of the articles you've read, 99.9% .9 of the articles you've read, you did not click on the footnotes. Right. Yeah, that'll be the case. So don't be wrong. People that are a footnote on a popular Wikipedia article are probably getting a lot of traffic from it. Not as much as if they were the original source of information, though. Not as much as Wikipedia gets, yes. Right. Um, do you want to advance the slides and just show... Um, People can join our private Facebook group. If you have questions that came up from today that were not answered, uh, Yen actually does moderate in there and he answers a lot of questions. And um, so you're welcome to join. It is a private Facebook group, but if you go there now and link, the link is in the chat for you, uh, we'll let you in and then you can pose any future questions there. And then we have a little bit of a summary on the, the Raider 8 and DBA platform, um, you know, how, how we hand in hand can help with this idea of reputation SEO. You know, reputation is going to have people choose you, but the SEO portion is being a choice in front of the consumer to begin with, right? And you need both pieces. You need to be there when the consumer is asking the question, and then they need to choose you based on, uh, you know, having a great reputation. And then finally, Chris, do you want to talk about the page that we launched for uh, people who want more information? Yeah. So, you know, in the to celebrate our partnership with, with Raider 8, we actually came up with um, some special packages and pricing that are only available to Raider 8 customers. So if you go to uh, dbaplatform.com 
slash Raider 8, you'll see those packages. Um, and then also we have all this great info to, to get in touch with uh, our friend Hugh. Yes, and if there's anything, if there's anything with uh, PBA that you need any help with, remember to address this, uh, Stacey with that in the chat. And Hugh, go ahead. No, I, I just am really happy to get to, to do this today with y'all. I've been excited about our relationship for, I don't know, probably seven, eight months at this point. Um, I think the DBA has a great offering, you know, to help our clients claim listings and really kind of add a, another level of um, SEO, you know, reputation SEO. Um, and, and likewise, if you're a DBA customer currently and you're not doing anything to, to really grow your number of reviews and have a platform to do that, we're, we're the best in, in healthcare. Without a doubt. Don't settle for a spork. That's right. That's no, right. get, get the full silverware solution. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. uh, Thank you well, all so much. Hugh, thanks for coming. Everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, please join us at our next webinar. More questions and answers, more digging into solving the problem of being found in all the places that you need to be. Oh, and don't forget to check out our new blog article about the insurance issue. The insurance uh, check on your Google business profile listing. If you go to our blog at dbaplatform.com, there's a fresh article just published this morning about that. Great. Have Thanks, great everybody. Day, everybody. Thank you.